local moms say their sons were molested here inside the new Children's Museum. We'll tell you what they say happened. Alleged patient dumping at Scripps and other hospitals around our county. What one former employee is saying tonight. And a statewide flex alert. You're urged to keep your major appliances off for the next three hours. We'll have more on that and a first look at your microclimate forecast. An Afghan refugee who escaped his home country is now giving back to refugees here in San Diego. It's a stressful time for students and parents. I researched the best tips to avoid back to school stress. And meet the Coronado coach introducing water polo to Ghana. CBS 8 News live at 6 starts now. Good evening. Thanks for joining us. I'm Marcella Lee. I'm Carla Chiquetta. We begin now with breaking news about an extremely talented newsman who made a huge impression on CBS 8 and all of San Diego. A few minutes ago, we learned about the death of Michael Tuck. He was a longtime News 8 anchorman. He worked here in the glory days of television news alongside Allison Ross, Clark Anthony, and Ted Leitner. He did a stint in Los Angeles, but returned to his anchor desk here, where he remained until a stroke in 2007 that left him unable to work, even toward the end of his career. And in poor health, he asked to be sent to cover the Gulf War. That was Michael Tuck. As we said, we are just finding out about this sad, sad news. A lot of us here did work with him back then. We will have much more for you tonight at 10 and 11. His wife of 16 years, Jill, told us Michael died this morning, leaving behind two sons and a daughter. Michael Tuck was 76 years old. A lot of heavy hearts tonight. Great broadcaster and a great man. Mm -hmm. Our other top story, a warning tonight. Two San Diego moms say their children were molested at the new Children's Museum downtown. Police and the museum are investigating. CBS 8's Anna Laurel has more on that and what the moms are saying tonight. Anna? A mom posted about what she says happened on a local mom's Facebook group. She says it happened here inside the new Children's Museum last Monday. She says an older child or a young teenager touched her three-year-old son and another six-year-old boy. Both moms filed a police report, and tonight the police and the museum are investigating. This is inside the new Children's Museum. Upstairs is an exhibit called The Wonder Sound. The museum's website describes it as a labyrinth of rooms, nooks, ropes. But according to a mom's post on this local mom's Facebook group, it's where a 12 to 14 year old white skinny Caucasian male with black glasses and a purple jersey sexually molested her three year old son and her friend's six year old son in an enclosed space just a few feet from where the mom stood. This is video a friend sent me from her museum visit in that same exhibit area. But the mom who posted about her son wants to stay anonymous. She says the teen looked like he was just a kind person helping my son climb up the ropes course. But on the way home, her friend's six-year-old son told his mom the teen took his hand into an enclosure space and asked to see his private area several times. He was touched along the outside of his pants and he tried to bribe him with Pokemon cards if he would let him touch him. The six-year-old refused, but when the mom of the three-year-old asked him if the teen helping him on the rope said anything, the toddler told his mom the teen placed his hand into his shorts and underwear and then touched his genitals. I reached out to the new Children's Museum and was supposed to interview Executive Director Elizabeth Yang Hellowell on camera this morning. That interview was canceled and I received this statement instead that reads in part, as an institution entirely focused on children and families, this incident is heartbreaking. In our 15 year history, this is the first report of its kind. The museum has increased surveillance by adding more security cameras and placing additional staff members in high traffic areas. We are continuing to evaluate our spaces and make adjustments. The San Diego Police Department's Child Sex Abuse Unit is also investigating. In San Diego, this is Anna Laurel for CBS 8. Thank you, Anna. A former Scripps Mercy employee is speaking out tonight about allegations the hospital often releases homeless patients who don't have a place to go. This is the city of San Diego moves forward with a lawsuit against Scripps for similar claims. It's called patient dumping, which is against the law here in California. As CBS 8's Shannon Handy found out, some say it's a consistent problem throughout the county. 
Our sources say this is happening not only at Scripps, but at UCSD and other hospitals in our area. The woman we interviewed calls it a system-wide problem that needs to be fixed to save lives. I was a patient care technician. We covered the woman's face to protect her identity. During her time working at Scripps Mercy, she claims it was common practice to see homeless people discharged without a place to go. In the emergency department, very regularly, if somebody wouldn't have been admitted to the hospital, you know, they're discharged and, you know, it's basically like you can leave now, like you need to go. In addition, she alleges the care they receive while at the hospital was inadequate compared to that of someone who's not unsheltered. Signs of, you know, what could be, you know, a stroke or heart attack, they would attribute it to, you know, this person is, you know, has some sort of mental illness. This person is just, um, they're on drugs. They are, they're an alcoholic. It's a risk to these people's life because they could miss some sort of diagnosis or some sort of treatment option. The former Scripps employee tells CBSA she was recently interviewed by the city attorney's office as part of a lawsuit against Scripps for this type of behavior, often referred to as patient dumping. Under a 2019 state law, California hospitals must have a homeless patient discharge plan, which includes offering the patient a meal and weather appropriate clothing, helping arrange an appropriate place to sleep, and transporting patients to the discharge destination within a maximum of 30 miles or 30 minutes from the hospital. You know, they weren't even given a bus pass or a taxi ride. Still, the woman we spoke with doesn't place all the blame on individual employees, saying the problem is much bigger in part because of a lack of resources. For example, while staff has a list of shelters, they either don't have time to call every one or there are no beds available. No matter how much good they want to do, the resources are not there for them. There's also the added challenge of homeless patients who don't want help and leave on their own. Overall, it's an issue plaguing hospitals all over San Diego. Up until March, Aaron Mellon had been homeless for 10 years. He alleges patient dumping happens frequently. The last time he says it happened to him was at UCSD. They're shooing me away and I have just a piece of gauze and a bandage on my leg, barefoot, in a statement, UCSD told us safety is a priority for all patients at time of discharge. I can confirm for you that our current process is that patients who are experiencing homelessness are at a minimum provided with a list of shelters and, if needed, means of transportation to arrive there. Meanwhile, Scripps said in part, Scripps Health has not received any complaints from patients regarding our hospital discharge process, which complies with state law regulations and local requirements. Scripps gives homeless patients whether appropriate clothing is needed, feeds them a meal, provides them with their prescriptions and or medication, screens them for infectious diseases, and offers them any necessary vaccinations. We ensure they are safe to leave the hospital and work with them to develop a discharge plan. If you would like to read the entire statement from Scripps, as as well as what the city has to say about this issue, log on to CBS8.com and click on this story. All right, Shannon, thanks. A flex alert is in effect right now and will stay in place until 9 o'clock tonight. So three more hours you have to go. You're being urged to cut back on your power usage to prevent strain on the state's power grid. 4 to 9 p.m. is when the grid is most stressed, and cutting back during these hours will help stabilize the grid and prevent power outages. With the high heat, I know the urge is absolutely there for folks to come home and go about their business, crank up the AC, don't change it, and not to change any of their patterns uh, for energy usage. But it's really important to be mindful and conserve whatever you can. To do your part, if you have air conditioning, set your thermostat at 78 degrees or higher or turn it off altogether until 9 tonight. Turn off any unnecessary lights, electronics, and don't use any major appliances, which means you get to take a break from doing laundry or running the dishwasher. Everything can be seen in a positive light. <laughs> yes. It is hot out there, though, Carlene. Yes, it is. We're talking about heat and the fact that Marcella does not like to do laundry. Yeah, we are talking about basically conserving that power grid. So keeping in mind up to about 78 degrees when it does come to this time frame, that voluntary flex alert going all the way until 9 p.m. tonight. We had highs today that were in the 70s and 80s right along the coast. We also had widespread 90, so still holding on to the heat as well as the humidity. We were at 94 degrees for Escondido and 
also at 92 for El Cajon. So when you're taking a look at current temperatures, you still have those 70s going strong right now. We also have to factor in the humidity, so that is still going strong as we continue to have monsoonal moisture that's lingering. Current temperatures across inland areas, mainly in the 80s, we're at 88 degrees for Ramona, 84 degrees right now for Poway, 86 for El Cajon. Now we will have temperatures cool a little bit more by the weekend, but we are still going to hold on to that humidity and even a chance we could see some thunderstorms west of the mountains. So all those details are coming up in your complete forecast. Carlo? See you, see you in a few, Carlene. Thanks. A year ago, chaos and violence erupted in Afghanistan when the U.S. withdrew troops and the Taliban took over. Hundreds of thousands of Afghan refugees fled, many coming here to San Diego to start over. CBS 8's Abby Alford talked to an Afghan refugee who is now thriving in our community and helping others. It's been nearly a year since Mr. Malmini and his wife evacuated their home country of Afghanistan. They came here to the Alliance for African Assistance for Help, and now he's giving back, helping other refugees resettle. As Afghan refugee Mr. Momini works on a case, he knows that he used to be a name in one of these files at the federally appointed resettlement agency, the Alliance for African Assistance in the college area. I said I'm a walking client, so if you guys can accept my case. And they did. They accepted. That was in September of last year. 23 days later, he and his wife moved into their new home in National City. And by December, he had a full-time job at the very place that he needed assistance. I really want to do this job from the bottom of my heart because I know I've been in their situation. He knows the fear, the panic, the anxiety of leaving family behind in Afghanistan where the Taliban have taken over and then having to start over in America. I've been in their shoes, you know. Uh, I know what they're going through. San Diego County's resettlement agencies report since the fall of Kabul, at least 2,600 Afghans have migrated to San Diego. Momini still fears the Taliban, and with many of his family members in Afghanistan, he does not want to reveal his identity. They're animals. When he was in high school, Momini proudly joined the Afghan military at only age 17 and became a translator for the U.S. Army. On August 15, 2021, when American troops started to withdraw, Momini says that he went to the Kabul airport to help thousands flee the violence. It was a chaos, you know, it was just a disaster. Five days later, he and his wife and uncle were able to evacuate. From Kabul, he flew to Qatar, Italy, Philadelphia, Texas, and then landed in San Diego where he knew a friend. We came with two backpacks. That was nearly one year ago. Now he has a home, a job to help refugees like himself start over in San Diego in a community that supported him when he needed it the most. I'm relieved. I'm out of there and I love everything here. There's also a silver lining for Mr. Momini's wife. She's able to attend college here in San Diego where she's learning English. Thanks, Abby, a success story. Absolutely, so great to see. Still a lot of work to be done on that front mm -hmm. with Afghan refugees, though.